Everdark, Episode 102, Dig Deep. Last on Everdark, Damon allows Julian to interview a man who might make a good vampire. He's dying, but doesn't quite want to go. Julian gets a chance to see himself through a human's eyes, but he and Damon are not the only vampires at the party. We now turn back to Christian. Christian? Christian! Fiona hissed. What is wrong? Uh, they don't want to be friends. Christian answered her as he took a few steps back. He didn't want to take his eyes off the drifting sisters, who were smiling with an eagerness to take his second life, that he found more than mildly disturbing. They just agreed to kill me. What? Fiona surged forward, but again, Kaymorn held her back. Try to use your Iros powers to convince them otherwise, Kaymorn suggested. I don't think I have enough time to do that. I don't quite have the calmness of mind to do it, Christian answered as he continued to retreat from the two ghosts, whose minds were filled with images of dipping their ghostly fingers in his blood. Can they do that? They're incorporeal. But the ghosts, whether they could do it or not, were deep in the fantasy of ripping him apart. You must be calm, Christian. You are in charge. Somehow, Kaymorn's statements did not help. Can they physically harm me? Christian asked. Yes, yes they can. Kaymorn answered. Great. Christian grimaced. One sister was drifting around to his right, while the other continued to approach him straight on. They were trying some kind of pincer maneuver. Wonderful. They're strategic. Images of them lapping at blood flowing from deep wounds in his throat while the other one ate his eyeballs, had Christian's gorge rising. It wasn't helping him remain calm. They're imagining eating me, Kaymorn. I I don't think I'm going to be able to divert them away from their chosen course. Christian's voice rose at the end. You're not even trying. Kaymorn tutted. It was true. Trying to touch and control the ghost's thoughts meant that he had to submerge himself in their fantasies of eating him, and he wasn't keen on doing that. Use hope's end, Christian. Use the daggers. Aren't you going to help me? Christian asked, as he saw the ghost to his right moving swiftly. She would get behind him, or the one in front would be right up on him. No, not yet. Let's see how you do. There are only two of them, Kamon said. Say the word, Christian, and I'll teleport us out of this mess. We'll leave Kamon behind. Fiona cast a dirty look at the Kali vampire. Christian's gaze swung between the bushes, and the fast-approaching ghosts as he unsheathed the magical daggers. They hummed in his hands. The hum spread up his forearms and biceps and shoulders and thrummed in his chest. You're a speaker to the dead. Nowhere is safe. Kaymorn's words from earlier echoed in his mind. There would be times when he wouldn't have Kaymorn or Fiona or Julian or Balthazar or anyone with him. He needed to learn how to do this. Not yet, Fiona. I want to try to do this. Christian muttered as his eyes flickered between the two ghosts. I'll give you a little rope, Christian, but don't mess this up. Balthazar is already going to kill all of us. Fiona reminded him. Yeah, I think you're right. That was the last thing Christian said, before he rolled away from the two ghosts that swung at them with their insubstantial arms. But he felt the air move, and there was a whistling sound. He leaped up to his feet and spun around to face them once more. Their lips had writhed back from their teeth. They weren't human teeth. They were fangs. All of them were fangs. Stop thinking like a human, Christian. You're stronger, faster, and better than they are. Kaymorn muttered the last. Not helping. Christian called as he sliced the daggers through the air in front of him. The stones and the hilts were glowing faintly. The hum and throb of them in his arms and chest made the weapon seem like a part of him. Yet he was still clumsy with them because he was scared. He could acknowledge that. It wasn't just the fact that they were ghosts, and though he might be a speaker to the dead and a vampire, he still had an atavistic fear of them. But their cruel minds were like daggers into his. Are you going to fight them or dance with them? Kaymorn sounded bored. His heel hooked a tree root and he went sprawling onto the ground. The two ghosts were upon them. He heard Fiona let out a gasp, but Kaymorn advised her to stay put. Christian was not so certain that was a good idea. The faces of the sisters rose above him. They were smiling, licking their lips and giggling. Their fingers reached down and stroked his cheeks, his throat, his chest, and even between his legs. 
far from arousing him. Everywhere they touched his flesh seemed to shrink away from their fingertips. They turned to look at one another in their zeal. He will die well, the one on the left said. No, sister, he will die screaming and sweet on our tongues, the other enthused. They both turned back to him and smiled. Even before they reached for him, their minds touched his. Christian's head rocketed back, and he struck himself against the ground from the force of that connection. Black spots flooded his vision. His hands lay numb and lifeless at his sides. The daggers were even more useless as he didn't have the strength to lift them. He found he couldn't even breathe. We have to help him, Camon. Fiona's voice wafted over to him. No, no, just wait, just wait, Fiona. He's stronger than you think. Camon answered her. We can't risk this. Fiona's voice was high and tight. Your wyvern, teleporting out of danger is in your blood. Christian must learn to tussle with death. Camon explained. That's madness, she cried. No, it is his life. Fiona, your loyalty to him speaks well of your character, but it will not make him strong. Camon told her. He needs to face terrible things. This is a controlled environment. There is nothing controlled about the Everdark, she snarled. Do you think the two ghosts are a threat to me? Camon asked her. That was the last he could hear of their argument. The ghost's fantasies continued to run rampant and slam into his mind. He witnessed his arms being pulled off while he was still alive. He saw himself eviscerated and the women pulling out his intestines as they giggled. Their thoughts were like wriggling worms. He didn't want to keep touching their minds to get more deeply immersed in their sick thoughts, but he couldn't keep them away. They flowed over him like water. He was drowning in them. He breathed and spat them out. Christian barred his teeth and tried to put some life into his deathly cold limbs, but they felt like ice blocks that were hardly a part of him. He imagined his limbs snapping off at the joints because they were so cold. They're draining him, Camon. Let me go. I need to get him out of here. Fiona cried. He will find a way to stop them. You must give him time, Fiona. Don't assume he's like you. He isn't. Camon hissed. Christian wished he had as much faith in him as Camon did. He was retreating deep within his body, within his mind. He couldn't seem to block out the sisters' thoughts. He actually started seeing beyond their current thoughts to old ones. He saw who they had been. They were setting the table for dinner. Their mother was hunched over the hearth. A boar was turning on the spit over the fire. The fat was dripping down onto the coals and hissing. The smoke drifted up and flavored the fatty meat. The skin crackled and darkened. Christian could almost taste the salty, fatty goodness on his tongue. Their mother was a pretty, faded woman who looked much like her daughters. She lived for them. They knew this and loved her for it and chafed under her observant eye. Their father was often gone, hunting and trapping and trading much of what he caught for other things they needed. It reminded Christian of the Americas at the earlier turn of the century. He was gone from home, but they hoped he would be back soon. They were eager for them. There was a knock on the door. The sisters looked at each other in surprise. They weren't expecting anyone. They lived apart from their neighbors. They were both excited and afraid. Their mother's right hand went to the axe by the side of the hearth. The one sister asked who it was. For long moments, there was no sound. And then there was a terrible bang that Christian mentally flinched from. The girls clutched at each other as their mother hefted the axe. She made a soft yet firm command for them to arm themselves. They grabbed fireplace instruments. Their hands were shaking. What happened to you that you changed from normal people to ones that want to rip and rend and taste blood? Christian thought. The door to their home shattered, and Christian saw what they saw. Red eyes, seven feet off of the ground, set in a face that should have been on a wolf. But it was much too big, much too humanoid. Werewolf? Christian realized. It was inside the house so fast that it seemed between one blink and the next. The creature was in the doorway, then on top of their mother. She had the time to bring the axe back, but not flow it forward before her throat was ripped out. She staggered backwards after the werewolf had bitten through the front of her neck. Her eyes were huge in shock. She took a few steps as blood arced from her throat, and then she fell like a tree felled in the forest. 
Blood pooled around her in an ever-widening lake, and Christian was horrified at how his stomach clenched with hunger. And then the werewolf turned on the sisters. It leaped, and its claws raked both sisters' faces. Blood spurted, the whites of the eyes were parted, screams turned to gurgles as throats filled with blood, and then it was on top of them like they were on top of him, feeding. He yanked himself out of those memories. The sisters had been alive for a long time as they had been devoured, so very long. His eyes cleared of the memory, and he saw the sisters' faces. Though they were white and blue, ghostly colors, he could still remember them as the living, breathing people they had been. But whatever pity he had for them was soon swamped by the knowledge that whatever had occurred to turn them, or maybe they were this way all along, they intended to do to him what had been done to them, maybe worse. There is a sad lack of sexy merman stories out there, but I'm happy to say that I've done my part. The Merman series on Amazon is a five novella gay romance between human Gabriel and his bonded mare partner, Prince Cassilis. Here's the summary. Gabriel Braven's destined love is a merman, Prince Cassilis Narion. Problem is, Gabriel doesn't believe mermen are real. And worse, Gabriel's parents died of drowning, so he has no love for the sea. But the sea is Gabriel's destiny in more ways than love. Caught by high tide in a cave, Gabriel drowns, but does not die. Cassilis brings him to the surface, but tells Gabriel that he must return to the waves or perish, for Gabriel is becoming a merman. This series is in a box set and is in Kindle Unlimited, so I'll just link to that in the notes for your convenience. The books are also available in audiobook. He had to do something. The sister on his right leaned down as if to kiss him. His vision was filled with her face, but then an idea came to him. He was a vampire. He was the speaker to the dead. He was an Iros. Their minds were his playground, right? Surely they were. So what if I change what they're thinking from fantasies to nightmares? Christian's eyes narrowed. The sister's arms were outstretched. Their fingers looked like curved claws. He could almost feel their nails raking down his skin. He reached for the sister's mind on the right. She was imagining hooking her nails into his cheeks and gouging deep furrows that would bleed profusely. He grabbed that memory and crushed it. She jerked to a halt. Confusion filled her eyes and she shook her head as if to clear it. But he didn't let her have a chance. He shoved a vision into her head instead. He imagined that the dagger in his right hand thrust into her ghostly chest. He imagined that the light that made up her ethereal form was sucked into the blade and into the red gem set in the hilt. He imagined her screaming silently as she was trapped inside of Hope's End forever. The other sister jerked her head to the side, confused by the other's abrupt cessation of movement. She reached for her sister that he had shoved the vision into. Her eyes grew wide and her mouth opened in an O oh of pain for her sister. She whipped back towards him, her eyes narrowing now, her lips peeling back from her fangs. She lunged down towards him. Christian thrust the daggers into her midsection. His icy limbs obeyed him. They gradually warmed as he kept them there inside of her ethereal body. It wasn't like stabbing into flesh, organs, and bone. At least he didn't think it was. He hadn't had the dubious pleasure of stabbing someone. It was more like jabbing into viscous water. There was hardly any give. In fact, his arms shook as the force he applied was way too much. She froze. There didn't seem to be any effect from the stab at first, even though he kept Hope's end inside of her. The hum that the blades gave off suddenly grew stronger and warmth flooded him. The ghost's eyes widened once more with alarm, with fear, with knowledge. Then, with a silent scream, just like he had imagined, she was pulled inside the gems. They glowed brightly. That's why they call these daggers Hope's End, Christian said to the remaining sister. There's no more hope for you, no more hope for her. I know you can understand me. She didn't need a translator. She knew what he meant. She fled into the woods, or she would have, but she didn't get very far. 
Kaymorn stepped out of the bushes, looking pristine, despite being rained on by needles and sap, and raised one hand. She froze not ten feet away. Then she turned, and with unblinking eyes she came back to the Kali vampire. A faint smile was on Kaymorn's lips as he fished out a gem from an inner pocket. This one was green. Kaymorn sent a puff of air towards her. The substance of her was disturbed, becoming no more than the sparkling blue dust that drifted towards the green gem, then disappeared inside of it. Kaymorn rubbed the gem against the front of his shirt as if to polish it, then he slipped it into the pocket he had taken it from. See? It wasn't so hard, Kaymorn said. Fiona raced to Christian's side and helped him to sit up. Are you all right? Christian put a shaking hand to his right temple. I- I'm not exactly sure. I have a splitting headache and probably frostbite. He looked down at his skin where the ghosts had touched. He fully expected it to be frosted gray, but they were normal, flesh-colored. He flexed and released his hands around the daggers. His fingers moved like normal. He almost couldn't believe it. Every evil thing they had imagined had felt almost real. He reached up and touched his cheeks. No gouges there, no wounds. Mm, you were in their minds almost the whole time, Kamon said. While Fiona stroked his cold limbs, helping bring life to them again, Kamon just stood there and regarded him evenly. I'm fine, Kamon. Thank you for asking, Christian put out. Kamon just lifted an eyebrow. Christian sighed. I saw how they died, Fiona gasped. You saw how they died? This had Kamon looking interested, in a way that his health had not. You saw that? I cannot believe that it was on the surface of their minds. Christian frowned. No, it wasn't. I think I was trying to understand how they had become like they were. How they became ghosts, you mean? Fiona asked uncertainly. No, how they became killers who lusted after blood and rending flesh. Christian explained. And how they died showed you that? Fiona asked. Kaymorn stared with a quiet intensity at him. That's quite a gift you have there. A werewolf killed them. Christian found himself staring at Kaymorn as he said this. The Kali vampire had a thing for werewolves. It was too much of a connection to think that Tarn or Farun had anything to do with these sisters' deaths. Then it must have been terrible indeed, Kaymorn replied lightly. They were alive while it ate them, Christian replied. Fiona offered him a hand to stand up. Christian was annoyed and unnerved that his limbs were still stiff and wobbled underneath him for a moment. Kaymorn saw this as well. He pursed his lips but said nothing. This encounter has drained Christian. We need to go back, Kaymorn, Fiona said after studying him for long moments. We can't, Christian cried as he thought that Kaymorn might agree with her. We can. And we will, Fiona answered tightly. Surely we're closer to the Well of All Souls than we are to the Spire? Christian looked between the two of them. It would make more sense to do what we came here to do. Balthazar is going to kill all of us for going this far. The two other vampires said nothing. He hadn't convinced them. I risked all of this to help Julian's parents, Christian said. Feeling was coming back into his limbs now. I can't just go back to Balthazar now. He won't let me out of his sight after this. We won't get another chance. And Callie will take the Harrows to who knows where. We'll never find them. Balthazar will listen to reason, Fiona said slowly. Will he? In time, though? Kaymorn lifted an eyebrow. Probably not, she admitted. She shook her head and put a hand to her temple. Can you blame him? The Harrows, though good people, are dead. Christian is alive. I can bring the Harrows back, Kaymorn said flatly. Is that really true, Kaymorn? Fiona put her hands on her hips and stared hard at the Kali vampire. I have told King Damon that I can. It would be the height of foolishness to make that claim if it was not true. Kaymorn replied dryly. But that is a risk I am certain you would take. She scoffed. Once it is clear that you had killed the parents of his fledgling, what choice did you have but to make some ridiculous offer? King Damon would know if I was lying, Kaymorn said. I think you could convince yourself you could do it, even if you weren't sure you could, she said. Maybe he's willing to give you that chance, but no one has been able to accomplish such a thing. Not even Callie. Yet you can. Fiona shook her head. I can. Kaymorn sounded so certain. 
but he always sounded that way. He was cold. He had been this way when he was about to be burned at the stake. So really it was no guarantee that he was telling the truth. You better not have lied, Kamorn, Christian said quietly. It'll break Julian's heart if you can't. It'll be like losing them all over again. He won't... He might not recover from that. And if that's the case, I don't think there'll be anything that King Damon won't do to make you suffer. Kamorn inclined his head. I am in agreement with you, Christian. I can do this thing, but we need to get those crystals back. I am willing to go on, but I know that you are weak on energy, and that is not a state you can be in. But I can't drink from anyone other than Balthazar, Christian said. You cannot, so I have a suggestion. Kamorn turned towards Fiona. Go get Balthazar and bring him here. Christian's eyes widened and he waved a hand in the air. No, no! It, didn't we all just agree that Balthazar won't let me do this if- If we returned you to him. But if Balthazar is here and Fiona refuses to take us back, he will have no choice but to go forward, Kamorn stated. Fiona let out a sharp laugh. You think he's going to accept that I won't take him back? Are you afraid he'll use his mind control on you? Kamorn asked. He could. She blazed at him. You downplay his powers, but he's Iros. Kamorn, he can make us both do a jig if he wants to. But he won't. He's honorable. And Christian here will convince him that going forward is the way. Kamorn told her calmly. He's afraid of who he was and what he did during the war, Fiona. That's why he won't harm us. You really think that? Her eyebrows crawled into her hairline. Maybe that's why you won't connect with anyone, Kamorn said quietly. Maybe, like him, you don't trust yourself, Wyvern. She stared at him coldly. One of these days, Kamorn, you are going to get yourself in trouble with that mind of yours that you can't get out of. And then she disappeared. She returned, though, in moments. Balthazar stared about him in confusion until his eyes alighted on Christian and then went to the twin moons and the forest around them. His eyes narrowed. Christian, Balthazar said with quiet determination, you are in so much trouble. Join us next time for episode 103, The Moment Not Seen. I have many completed gay romance series on Amazon. There's Cinders and Ashes, a gay high fantasy series loosely based on Cinderella. The Vampires Club, a fast paced contemporary gay romance series that has vampires and takes place in a nightclub. The Bodyguard, which is a bodyguard protectee slow burn romance with a supernatural twist and much more. Every month I make at least two of these books free to download. If you wanna know when that happens, the easiest way is to join my old-fashioned mailing list to get free book alerts. I'll post a link to the mailing list form in the notes.